know, sorry, I feel like I started talking too soon. That song was just starting to get good. Um, as Colin mentioned, thank you for the kind introduction. My nickname is Kiki, now everyone knows. Um, yes, Drake did write that song for me. Um, I'm really excited to be here today talking with you all about creating a culture of innovation. And although I work in the education space, these lessons are really learned um, from across sectors. Um, and so I hope they'll be relevant whether or not you're in education, business, technology, or any other sector. To start, I thought it might just be helpful to tell you a little bit about how I use the clicker. <laughs> ah, turning it on, yep. How's that? Great. We're rolling. All right. Um, so I work at an organization called Education Elements. I've worked in education for the last 15 years. And as a partner at the company, um, I support more than 800 schools and districts that range in size from a single school district that has 50 employees to mega districts that have more than 100,000 employees. Um, and in all of this work, we're really helping districts think about how can they change the culture the way teaching and learning happens, the way collaboration happens, the way decision making happens in their schools and districts. Um, and you know, in that work, a lot of times people say we want to be innovative, right? Like we want to be like Starbucks, we want to be like Stitch Fix, all those leaders you heard from this morning. Um, but oftentimes when I ask them this question, it kind of draws a blank. So I know you all just ate lunch, but I'm going to ask you a few questions just to get the energy flowing. What do you think innovation is? Just shout it out. New? New? New ideas, change, first. disruptive, first. Yeah, usually I get a lot of answers along those lines, right? Innovation's new, it's something new, it's something different, it's something disruptive. And I agree with that. In fact, the definition of innovation is that top part in gray that comes from the dictionary, right? It's any new method, product, or idea. But I've added the second piece, which I think is so important, that it has to create value. So if we think of innovations that have actually changed the world and made lasting change, fire, the wheel, right, the printing press, the iPhone, anything else you can think of, they had some way of adding value. It wasn't just new for new's sake. And so when we talk about creating a culture of innovation, it's not just a culture where people are doing new things, because that's actually quite exhausting. And I think to Howard's point this morning can be very inhuman to just say we value new. But it has to be something that creates new for value for human beings that work in your organization or the customers that you serve. And I define culture really simply as just the actions and behaviors that you exhibit on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we say culture of innovation, it's how can we create a place where people's actions drive these new ways of doing things that create value. And many organizations are trying to think about how they can be more innovative. So you all may have seen this data. It comes from Deloitte's Global Human Capital Trend. How many of you are familiar with those reports? They're a really great resource if you're looking to see like what are organizations around the world thinking about. This data comes from 2017, but I think it's still very relevant this year. They surveyed 10,000 leaders across the world, and they asked them, how many of you are thinking about the future organizational design, becoming more flexible, becoming more responsive? And 88% of leaders said, yes, we're thinking about that. That's the most important thing, in fact, that we're considering. But when they asked them, OK, great, you're thinking about it. How many of you feel prepared to do it? only 11%. And so if many of you are in this session because you think, yeah, I want to have this culture, but I have no idea how to create it, just know you're not alone. Many leaders struggle with this. And so my working hypothesis and the reason I do the work I do, the reason I write the books I do, <laughs> to Colin's point, is that I think if we really want our employees to design innovations, if we want our frontline employees to be driving this, we have to support them with a culture that grows and supports innovators. And so for the rest of the presentation, you're actually going to hear me not say innovation again, I hope. I might say it once. But I'm really going to focus on the people as innovators. OK, so next question for you all. What is an innovator? You told me what innovation was. What's an innovator? What key characteristics d define someone? Creative. Creative. Curious. Curious. Forward thinking. Forward thinking. Collaborative. Collaborative. That's a good one that often gets left out. Risk taking. Yeah. Did you all see my slides? No? Are they previewed somewhere? Oh, OK. Well, <laughs> I think you got all of those. I would add maybe nonconformist, which I think goes with risk taking. So sometimes it's someone who doesn't fit in. In fact, sometimes innovators struggle in organizations with a lot of formal um, rules and processes. Creative, self-directed, risk taker, reflector. Um, and I think that collaborative piece is so important. So do you think innovators are born or made? How many think born? Just born? Yeah, a few. 
Steve Jobs just like came out that way. How about, how about made through experiences? How many think both? Yeah, I tend to agree. I think it's a little bit of both. Here's why. I'll tell you just a couple personal stories. Um, this is me. Uh, you might notice that I was a nonconformist from a young age. That is our formal family portrait, and I did choose to wear a bathing suit, <laughs> in case you didn't see that, the one with the ruffle. Yep. Um, so while everyone else has their Sunday best on, I thought I would, you know, really represent my family well at Sears in my bathing suit. So I don't think anyone taught me to do this. It's just something that I wanted to do from a young age. I wanted to stand out. Um, I grew up in a mountain town in rural southern Oregon, so this is where I grew up. And I also think I learned how to be an innovator because of the circumstances that I was raised in. Um, so we lived 30 miles away from the nearest grocery store, you know, had no television, internet. At that time, no one had internet. Um, phone service, anything like that. And so, does anyone know, did anyone else grow up in a rural area? A few of you? Okay, do you know what, like, the most important tool, and even if you didn't, you can shout it out, the most important tool someone in a rural area needs? Not your imagination. A lot of people say that this is an actual thing you can hold in your hands. Books? Huh? Duct tape. Duct tape. Correct! You're the first one to ever get that right. Did you grow up in a rural area? Yeah, okay, yeah, so for those of you who didn't, let me just tell you, Joe Duggan, my father, if your pants didn't fit, duct tape them, right? Bigger or smaller. If your screen ripped out on your window, duct tape it. If the truck door doesn't close anymore, duct tape it, right? So duct tape was like the thing we used to solve all problems. But I think it really helped me understand that problem solving doesn't require a lot of resources or money, which was really helpful as I went into some roles in education. Final story. Um, I moved from that rural mountaintop to Los Angeles for college. And at that time, again, no cell phones, no GPS. I used a Thomas Guide. Has anyone had? Yeah, Thomas Guide map. Yeah, I love those. I still have one today. Um, and it's basically each page is a quadrant of the city. So I would physically plot out how to get from my dorm room to the beach across South Central. And through that, I learned a ton about Los Angeles I never would have learned um, because of taking those risks. So those are all my young formative years, right? Then I get my first job, I'm a teacher. Um, then I become a coach and a school leader and suddenly I find that culture is very different. So I don't know how many of you have had an experience like this with a manager. Right, where you're encouraged to please take risks but don't make any mistakes and your ideas are kind of stupid. <laughs> Right? And so I, I became obsessed with asking the question, like, why in this place where we're supposedly focused on learning, are we not teaching children how to be problem solvers, creative learners, right? People who are taking risks. And so I started leaving education and, and working with these other organizations. So um, Howard is actually a member of our board, and he was really great and started connecting me with other leaders in other organizations. We're based in Silicon Valley. And so I'd go to Google, I'd spend a week at Twitter, and I'd say, like, what's different here that's not happening in our classrooms? Why is there a different kind of culture going on here? And so the recipe that I'm going to share with you today is really based on those conversations and thinking about what can we bring back to our organizations um, and really make our own. And it's called a recipe, not a rule book, because, well, one, I love cooking. Um, Top Chef is my favorite show. And I think great leaders are like great chefs, right? So when a chef starts their career, they're following a recipe pretty strictly. Or in my house, you're following what your grandma does, right? And you're not deviating from that because that person knows best. But as you get more comfortable, you start knowing like when you need a dash of salt, when you need a little bit more oil, and you don't need to follow that recipe so rotely. And I think these ingredients are very much the same. So I put them on the first four tables, kind of on the inside. If a big part of creating a culture of innovation is being collaborative. So I think there's enough for everyone. But if not, maybe you can share with a neighbor, or raise your hand if you need one. And I'm just going to give you a quick tour. And then what I want you to do is actually vote on which one or two, depending on timing, we go deep in. So I know you chose this session, but I'm a big believer in choice. And I want you to really drive what the last half of this workshop is all about. And I'll be transparent. A big part of innovation is being vulnerable. I haven't used this tool before. So I think it's going to work, but we're, we're in it together. We're going to see how it goes. Um, so just to orient you, each of the ingredients talk, starts with people. As I said earlier, I think people are what drive new and valuable ideas, not systems. Um, and so the, the key ingredient or the foundational ingredient is at the top and they all kind of build on each other, starting with deep trust, which is the idea that people uh, really feel safe to share their opinions and they understand the rationale behind decisions. 
Next is a shared purpose, which is making sure everyone's inspired and moving in the same direction and that they really have a language to talk about why, what we're doing and why. Constant curiosity comes next. It's going back to what you all shouted out for what is innovation, what is an innovator. It's asking questions and learning and sharing with each other constantly. Then it's moving beyond just am I curious and asking questions to network teams and saying, are we functioning as units and actually sharing and making decisions in a collaborative, cohesive way? And then finally, and this is often the hardest one for leaders, it's empowering others to be agents of change. So releasing to say, I don't always need to be the one in control of these decisions. So with those in front of you, feel free to mark them up. If there are certain ingredients that really stand out to you, um, you'll see in the middle column, much like a recipe, it helps you diagnose if you might need a little bit more of this ingredient. So if you're seeing that people feel like decisions are coming out of the blue, that's something I often hear when I start working with an organization, there might be a trust issue there. So a lot of times people think we're not communicating well, but if someone's saying over and over again, I don't know why this decision's being made, there might actually be some fundamental trust that's absent. Um, and then on the far right, it gives you a way to add a dash of this. Okay, so as you're looking at those, you're marking them up. If you want to pull out your cell phones, I think this will be pretty easy. You just go to menti.com. Has anyone used Menti before? It's an awesome free polling tool. And you put in that code, 981221, and you can vote for the ingredient you want me to go deep on for our last half. And I think we'll have time to go into two of the ingredients. So I'm going to leave this up for a moment, and then Andrew is going to switch over to the live results. Moment of truth. Is it working for someone who's voted? We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ninety-eight twelve twenty-one. Oh yeah, I can see it right there. If you want to write it down, ninety-eight twelve twenty-one. And that might be a different. I think this is a different uh, Andrew Link than the one that came up before. Like I said, we're, we're trying something new together. If you click on the top, the graph. Yeah, thank you. There we go. All right. Woo! So now you can see we have 28 votes, 29, 30 in the bottom right corner. We'll give it another minute so everyone's vote counts. All right, we're gonna call it for time and we'll go into deep trust and network teams, but with the promise that those of you who voted for anything else, I'm happy to connect with you and I have a lot of resources I can share out um, with the Tiny Pulse team to send out after this presentation. So with that, we'll go back to the slides and we'll start with deep trust. Okay, so for every ingredient, there's kind of two pillar components that I think about um, in terms of like what makes this ingredient come to life. The first um, for deep trust is psychological safety, and the second is visible decisions. And I have come up with like a little mini activity to help you kind of understand and process these ideas. So if you wanna have a notepad out, or if you have your cute little tiny pulse orange notebook, you can even use the back of the ingredients card if you want. There's gonna be a little bit of time to do some quick note jotting. So psychological safety, how many of you are familiar with this term? It's gotten pretty hot and popular in the last few years thanks to Google's research. Um, so Amy Edmondson, who's a researcher at Harvard, was a graduate student, for those of you who don't know, and she was researching medical teams. She was trying to answer the question, what makes certain medical teams more successful than others? Have higher surgery success rates? Have lower mortality rates? And, you know, obviously she thought probably the teams making the fewer mistakes were the more successful, right? That's what you would think. You want a doctor who has a lower mistake rate. Um, but what she actually found when she followed these teams around for a few years is that the teams making more mistakes, or at least talking about those mistakes, were more successful. Um, and she coined the term psychological safety to name what was happening in those teams. That those teams were a place where people knew, even in life or death circumstances, that they would not be punished for raising a question, for admitting a mistake. <coughs> Fast forward a few years later, and Google spent, I think, about $20 million in two years studying 200 teams across the organization, um, trying to answer the question, question, what makes a team more effective than another team? 
They had ruled out that it wasn't just managers. They had found out that it wasn't the pedigree of a person, so what graduate school they had gone to, or their intelligence level, or even their experience. What they found was that the number one factor making some teams at Google more effective was this same concept of psychological safety. The second part of deep trust, so after you have that foundation of safety, <laughs> is making your decisions <laughs> visible, right? You're laughing because as leaders, we're all really good at the top thing, right? Let's go, we're gonna hit this goal together. We're gonna win the game, right? We're gonna improve our sales. We do this all the time. What most of us struggle to do is leave the breadcrumbs behind to help others understand when we get off track or when the plan has gone completely bust, right? And so the reality is most plans look more like the bottom and we don't often name, we're in a pit right now. Here's something new that happened that we didn't expect. Here's a mistake we made and here's how we're learning from it. So what I'd like you to do is just jot down for yourself on whatever notepad you have nearby, and if you're comfortable, share with a neighbor, a time in the last week where you had a decision to make and you either made it visible, so that's a positive example, you narrated, here's what we're doing and why, and here's where it might go awry, or where you didn't, which is more often what we learn from, right? So a time that you made a decision in the last week and didn't narrate the rationale or the potential um, risks. So take a minute, write it down, and I'd really love for you all to just dialogue with each other for a couple minutes. When have you made or not made your decisions rash, uh, visible? And I hope it goes without saying, you might have to start by introducing yourself to your neighbor. <laughs> That's always the fun part of conferences. <laughs> Hi, my name is, and this is how I made a mistake last week. <laughs> Come back. Hey. I'm Mark. Hi, Mark. Nice Mark. to meet you. Yes, I don't know. Just for the video, maybe yeah. standing in the middle. In the middle. Would be Thank you. Sorry about that. All right, we're gonna come come back together. I know that was just like a little, just a little snack on the buffet of innovation. So. Hopefully you got some good ideas, maybe reflecting on something you have or haven't done in the past. This is one of my favorite examples of how you can make decisions visible. I know the text is super tiny, so let me just plug it for you. This comes from Laura Hogan, who is the VP of Engineering at Kickstarter and then Pinterest. And she used to send out these week in review emails. And I think they're gorgeous because they help narrate the thinking behind decisions being made. So she, you can see she said, you know, when I started learning about travel and entertainment budgets, here's, I heard that it was on folks' minds, then I investigated it, then I learned a lot about corporate budgeting, and kind of like, here's our company stance, here's what I know, and here's what you should be thinking about. And every week when she heard things from people, she really helped everyone have those breadcrumbs, connect those dots for why they've made the decision they've made. She has a great website. She's a consultant now that works with engineering leaders around the country, so check out Laura Hogan if you want to learn more. 
Okay, this is the fun part where I just jump through and you're like, wow, those look so great. I wish we could learn about all of them. Um, <laughs> I promise I'll send out all the slides. Um, but we'll go with network teams. I think we have time for one more ingredient. And I'm standing in the middle for you, Mark. Um, Network teams, similarly, kind of have two core components. One is just that work is networked, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how most of us don't actually work in networked teams. And then two is some of us do have networked teams, but we don't actually use it to drive collaboration, right? So we're doing it for the sake of doing it, but it's not actually resulting in more collaborative work. Um, so many of us, I think, are thinking about shifts in terms of moving from these very hierarchical, top-down structures to something that's less command and control and more aligned, empowered, right, responsive, self-managed, teal, et cetera, right? Um, but most of us don't make the jump from one side to the other. And so I really like these diagrams. They come from General McChrystal's book, Team of Teams. And I think there's kind of this middle scenario that most of us live in, or we're at least trying to move towards, which is that we have this, instead of command and control, we have a command of teams. So our whole organization might not be networked yet, but we're at least trying to get our small functional teams, right, or our departments to work more like a network. Um, and so the question is, how can you make these networks high quality? And get ready, I'm a consultant, so you're about to get a two by two quadrant. Yeah. All right. <laughs> So what I'd love you to do on your paper is if you just want to draw a T, right, make your little quadrant. Think about on one of the teams you sit on right now, I know many of you may sit between a number of different teams or departments, um, what kind of network do you have happening in your team? And I'll go through these quickly just so you have a sense. Um, deal networks are very deep in terms of relationships, but they don't really have a shared purpose. So these often can be like sales relationships. Um, a lot of times they can be based on standing trust that's existed in the past, but you don't really have work together anymore. Resilient ne networks, number two, have that's kind of you know the target zone always. <laughs> Um, that's where you have deep relationships, shared purpose, and there's a lot of cross-boundary collaboration happening. Tribal networks, number four, I'm just coming around clockwise. You have a good amount of um, relationships happening, but you have very individualized purposes. Um, so what it ends up creating are a lot of silos that are working really closely together, maybe two or three people, but not necessarily with the rest of the team. And then third is no network, right, which is where you just have these like shallow transactional relationships happening with no purpose. And here's what I'll say just before you rate yourself. I was like, of course, I don't have any no network relationships, right? But when I thought about it, I thought, oh, wow, some of my newer clients who I haven't built a relationship with, where we're really just focused on what they've hired us to do, it is quite transactional, and there really isn't a network yet. And I just want you to know that's OK. That's not bad. It's just good to acknowledge where you are. Um, because by naming that I had a client in a no network zone, I knew I needed to spend time building relationships. And then that was more important even than moving forward on the project, right? So just take a moment, think about a team you're on, and just mark down which quadrant you feel like that team's living in right now. What type of network exists? And again, if you feel so compelled, always great to learn from each other. So if you want to share with a neighbor where you are and why, we'll just take about 30 seconds for this. All right, we did a high-tech poll, so this time we're going to do something a little more low-tech. I'm also trying to cue you up for the next presenter or for your coffee break or whatever. We're going to just do like a quick heat map with our bodies, which sounds really sexy, but really it's just standing up. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to go through an order, one, two, three, four. And if you are in that network, we're going to be a little vulnerable and just stand up and kind of get a pulse on where the room is. So how many of you existed in the deal network? So you had deep relationships, a lot of shared resources, but not a 
lot of shared purpose. All right, one, thank you for standing. Two, three, okay, a few, thanks. How about resilient network? Deep collaboration, deep relationships, super clear on shared purpose. Excellent. We need the names of all your teams and companies so we can come work with you. <laughs> Thank you. How about um, tribal network, number four? Siloed teams, yeah, that's pretty common. So you have some deep relationships, but individualized purpose. Okay, and then how about no network? <laughs> that's all right, I'm there too. Great, I think so given that most of you are in tribal networks, I'm gonna just do a little dancing around. I think this will be most useful for the most people in this room. So this is something I'd love for you to take back, maybe as homework to do with your teams. I think this applies um, to both tribal and um, resilient. Is really like naming your purpose, right? So sometimes a purpose is a lofty vision, sometimes it's much more specific to like the purpose of this project we're working on together. And people are usually pretty good at doing this. The second part, people skip, and I feel like this is one of the best ways to form that deep shared movement and purpose together, which is define your theory of action. It can be as simple as this sentence, we believe if we do X, it will lead to Y. And if you can't get everyone in the room to agree on what that is, it's very, very hard to make your network move in the same direction, right, and have that deep shared purpose. So go back in a meeting and in individual conversation, see if you can start finding out how many different hypotheses there are, how many different theories of action, and if you can start moving everyone towards the same one. With that, I know Colin's coming to kick me off. I'm just gonna leave you with this parting thought while he comes up to the stage, which is my favorite quote. How many of you have read Work Rules? Laszlo Bach, People Officer, yeah, at Google. Which is just, if you're creating a culture of innovation more than anything else, try to make yourself a little nervous. If you haven't given people enough freedom, you're not gonna be nervous and neither are they. As you saw on stage today, try a new tool in front of an audience you've never met before, right? Try to make yourself a little nervous, and that's the best way you can make change. So thanks so much for having me today. Thank you, Kara. All right, so huge thank you to you, Kiara. Um, there were a few questions, just as a reminder, for this breakout and all breakouts, whether it's uh, session one or room one or room two on Slido, that's where you can put your questions and upvote them. Uh, we had a variety of them come through uh, already. This was an interesting one, uh, and I'd love if we have time, I know we only have a couple minutes to hear more, dive deeper into the duct tape uh, thing you brought up. But um, what is your favorite company culture uh, from visits you've done, it can't be your own, the person did specify that, uh, and why? Oh, that's, a really, that's a really great, tough question. You know, I, I don't wanna deflect the question, but I think what Margot said this morning, for any of you who are here, is really true. I think every company culture is good when it fits that organization's needs, right, and the people there. So I'll share one example, but I, I don't know if when I leave this room today, people are gonna be like, Kiara said that was the best company. So I visited Otterbox, which you know makes those really awesome cases we all use <laughs> to waterproof our yep. phones, yeah. And the thing that I love the most about it, they're in Colorado, which is where I live, is that everyone who works at Otterbox is an otter. And otters are like embedded into everything they do, which like, I don't just mean they had like cute pictures of otters, but they were like, what is an otter? An otter is industrious, collaborative, right? They can change the shape of water, they're powerful. And so like everything from the soda machines to the conference rooms to like the newsletters they had were all about like, how can you embody being an otter um, from when they hire people to when they promote and give um, shout outs. So I really liked Otterbox. Shared purpose and a shared visual or um Animal, I yeah. suppose, in that case. Shared can, animal, uh, right. So I'm going to do two more questions. Um, uh, this is a really good one. Uh, bias is an, an innovation killer. How do you overcome bias in your approach to create an innovating or innovation culture? Yeah, that is such a good question. Thank you for whoever asked that. Um, so a lot of the work that I do with leaders, actually before I even let them start thinking about, not let them, it's not like I'm in control, but before we usually start thinking about these ingredients, we do a lot of work on self as a leader. Um, and we have eight competencies we work on with leaders. The first is know yourself. So the idea is if you don't know your personal story, if you don't know your values and how you show up to work, it is very hard for you to be able to authentically nurture trust with others. So knowing yourself, then being able to nurture trust, and then you're ready for some of the things we talked about with psychological safety and rational decisions. That's great. Um, and sorry, I lied two more uh, before we let you go. Um, how do you recommend marketing 
and the idea of innovation or innovating to a larger organization that's maybe not as small uh, and uh, as dynamic or complex? Yeah, well, I don't know. Has anyone ever worked in a large school district? <laughs> yeah, they pretty much hate innovation more than any other <laughs> industry. So they're like, no, things are going really well. We're succeeding every day. Um, we've all been in our jobs for like 60 years and we don't want to change. So I'm very familiar with this question. Um, I think the, the most important thing that you can do is just start um, identifying a theory of action and sharing small wins. So it's amazing how contagious it is. I'm sure you've all experienced this when you start winning, however you define that, other people want to be part of the winning team. And I think often for large organizations, they define winning only as hitting whatever the highest level goal is. So if for education, it's can we improve student outcomes, which is an enormously difficult thing to achieve. So instead we say like, how else could we win in two weeks, in three weeks, right? And it's like, well, if teachers start showing up to staff meetings, that would be a win, because it would mean they actually like value what we're doing. And so then the next, uh, team hears, oh, well, everyone went to that meeting because it was really valuable. What can we do in our meeting to make everyone want to come, right? So really thinking about that ripple effect. Excellent. So last question, because this kind of ties into Tiny Pulse and asking questions and gathering mm -hmm. feedback. Uh, this was an interesting one based on your quadrants. Yeah. So um, how does the use of employee surveys differ between identifying or figuring out uh, which quadrant that you're in? Yeah. Um, great question, and I actually have a list of questions that go with each quadrant, so whoever asked that, if you want to connect with me, I'm happy to share it, but I think great. Tiny Pulse is a great example, like asking a simple question, um, like do you feel like you are working towards a shared purpose with your teammates, right, or do you collaborate with people outside of your department, that data can help you identify if your gut about what quadrant you're in is right, and if it matches up with the broader team. Love it. So. Use Tiny Pulse. I always love yeah, to hear that. Yeah, that's right. Use Tiny Pulse. Great. Let's give one more round of applause to Kiara. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks Kiara. so much.